How's everyone doing? Good. Um, my name is Stephen Wise, and I'm the instructor for this course. So the course is numbered 515, and it's called, I think, Analytical Applied Mathematics or something like that. Um, and it's often a topics course. And so this time I'm teaching it uh, as a topics course where I'm going to cover uh, asymptotic methods and perturbation theory. Okay. Uh, there's a Canvas uh, portal for this uh, course. Uh, has anyone gone to that? Okay. So normally uh, I will post the slides uh, there prior to class. I was running a little late today and didn't get to do that. So uh, the way it usually works is you can follow along uh, with, uh, on the slides on your device. And you can make margin notes um, either on the slides themselves or on paper, or you could just keep uh, good mental notes. You always have a copy of the slides. So taking notes in class is up to you. Um, I will also provide uh, more or less uh, a book version of these, these notes. So in fact, what I do is I type the, the lecture notes first in sort of a, a book form or uh, a standard eight and a half by 11 page form. And then I convert them to the slides and you'll see how that conversion works well in some cases and not as well in other cases. Some things it's just not easy to take from a standard page size and put on a slide size piece of paper or in that slide aspect ratio. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of people joining online. Uh, and um, can if, if uh, you can hear me online, could you give me a thumbs up? Can you hear me online? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Uh, and you're welcome to ask questions online. I can hear you. I'll try to remember to repeat your question uh, so that the in-person audience can can hear and understand as well. Sometimes I'm silly and I forget, and I'll just you'll hear me muttering something uh, that doesn't make any sense, and it's maybe because I'm answering a question from someone online. You can also follow along online if you want which is kind of strange sometimes, follow along online and in person simultaneously. Uh, I'll try to check, remember to check chat um, whenever uh, questions are posted there. And um, sometimes you at home can see the chat question before I do and may have to remind me that there's a chat question. Um, or you in the audience, I guess. There will be a couple of homework assignments in the course, but to be quite honest with you, uh, I'm working a lot on preparing these course notes, and uh, the harder thing to do is sometimes prepare good homework problems, so there might not be all that many homework problems because I'm really focused on preparing the lecture notes and the slides, and sometimes I don't get around to making up homework sets. So that means that you'll have to rely a lot on paying attention in class if you want to learn something. I do hope to get at least two homework sets to you, and th they won't be timed exercises in, in any way. And you can work with other uh, students to get those solved. And, and everything is basically geared toward helping you understand the uh, theory of uh, of the of the the topic, perturbation theory and and asymptotic analysis. Uh, let's see. So homework assignments aren't given as sort of punishment or preparation for anything else except for learning the material. That's the design of the course. So in some sense, this is more like a six hundred level course in nature than a five hundred level course. There will be some theory in the course theorems, uh, definitions, proofs, things like that. 
So I think there's something in the course for everyone because there are engineers and scientists, some working scientists in the course. Some of you like the mathematics and will only care about the mathematics and some of you will only care about the applications and some of you be in between caring about applications and mathematics and some of you won't be interested in the rigor or the proofs and only uh, interested in the how things work and maybe why things work. I will point out that as a mathematician, I don't, I view a theorem or a proof as being the most practical thing on earth because it actually tells you something when you assume something. So in that sense, I think theorems and proofs and things like that are useful and rigorous or let, let's say useful and practical. But some of you aren't as interested in that and I'm, uh, I'm perfectly fine with that. The homework that I assign will not necessarily, will mostly be practical in nature in the sense of just doing a computation using formulas and uh, things that you can derive by doing integrals and differential, solving differential equations and things like that. Uh, so some of you uh, will be joining online. Some of you will be joining online asynchronously. So you'll be hearing this uh, after the fact. So uh, you'll see in Canvas, there are only two ways that I'm going to grade in the course or two, two elements that I'll use for deriving a grade. The first will be homework assignments. As I said, there won't be that many of them. And the other will be attendance. And so you might wonder, how do you count attendance if, if I'm joining asynchronously? Are you, how are you going to track that? So um, if you're joining asynchronously, meaning you're listening to this after I'm speaking it, maybe days or months or, or so, uh, so it's, it's just going to be by the honor system. So if you tell me uh, and you have a good excuse that that uh, requires you to uh, attend asynchronously, then send me a, a, an email and um, we'll work that out. Uh, some of you are working right now. That uh, Some of you are at work literally and listening to this several hours after I'm speaking it. And so you can't attend uh, synchronously. And so that's fine. I want you to be a part of the course anyway. So I'm gonna allow for maximum flexibility. Now, if it starts dwindling down to the point where the in-person attendance is only like one or two, then we may have to do something. If we want to switch it all to be entirely online, um, that's something we can talk about as well, because I don't mind sitting in my office giving the same lecture. It's a little nicer whenever I see nodding heads and things like that. I have given lectures where it's just me recording it into a device and that's the worst of all scenarios because I get no feedback and you can't tell if anyone's listening, understanding, uh, interpreting, whatever. Uh, but anyway, I'm happy to do this in hybrid format as long as everybody's happy to, to, to be here. Uh, if you can't attend in person and you need to be away at a conference, you don't have to let me know. You just attend remotely unless it starts getting to be where everybody's at the same conference all the time sort of thing. Then we'll have to uh, have a discussion about how we want to run the course. In any case, are there any questions? So the type lecture notes will be posted on um, Canvas as well as the typed uh, slides. If uh, So I've typed up a bunch of stuff already in preparation for this course. And I think I will be able to do everything latex beautifully in Beamer um, and uh, everything latex in, in beautifully uh, for the slot for the lecture notes as well. Uh, but it, if it if it gets to the point where I have to give written uh, handwritten lecture notes, I'll do so also from from uh, Notability, and um, I'll just give those to you after the fact or maybe even ahead of time, or whatever. But uh, I, I, right now, I, I expect never to give any board lectures in here. Um, everything will be done via, via the iPad. OK. Um, there are some references for the, for the uh, course that are, are pretty good to have on hand. Uh, those are in Canvas, and so I won't go there at the moment. And I didn't uh, copy them here 
into the slides. Maybe I'll do that actually uh, after I revise these slides uh, today or tonight or tomorrow. Um, but they're also contained entirely in Canvas. One of the most famous is this book by Bender and Orzag, um, which is uh, well known to maybe some of you. It's been around since the late 70s. Uh, it's the book that I used whenever I took this course a number of years ago. And it's a classic. It's also freely available to you as UT students. Uh, so it's a Springer book. It was published uh, at one point in time by McGraw-Hill, but now it's been republished by Springer and it's uh, available by a Springer link for free to UT students. So if you want a good reference, good standard reference for this course, then that's a fr good free uh, um, resource for you. Yes. Sorry, can you repeat the title? It's, uh, I forget the title. The authors are Bender and Orzag. And um, it's on the Canvas uh, portal. Advanced Mathematical Methods for Scientists and Engineers. It's the stupidest name, I think, <laughs> for what it is, because it's really a book about perturbation theory and asymptotic methods, asymptotic expansions. They, they should really call it that. Um, there are lots of books on that topic. Um, and I'm writing a book on that topic, which will be available uh, probably in four years' time, I, I would guess, just knowing how long it takes to, to get a book turned around. And the co-author is going to be a, a, a professor named Tadeli Mangesha uh, from this department. So we're, we're working on that, preparing that. And uh, the best way to learn something or relearn something is to teach a course on it. So that's what I'm doing. And um, it should be about six or seven chapters and cover all that we're going to cover in this course. But so when you do get the lecture, the typed lecture notes, keep those close at hand. And um, also don't share them, please, because uh, someday it will be uh, a, a book that will be available to everybody. All right. Um, I think with that said, maybe we're ready to get started. Uh, the the uh, topics that I plan to cover are the same as the, the ones that I publicized with the flyer that I sent around that to many or most of you have seen. It's the same uh, set of topics that also appears on Canvas. The first thing I'm going to do in the course is use some problems from physics and engineering to motivate what I want to do uh, with the course and with the with the topics. All right. Um, I don't know how far we'll get today. Um, I think I'll cover most of the uh, slides in this in the in the current deck, but uh, it's not available yet. And I'm sorry, I just didn't have enough time. It will be available by tomorrow or Thursday, and it'll be roughly the the way I do it is I'll do a slide deck for per chapter, not per lecture. So I'll do one slide deck for chapter one, which is where we are now. It's not complete. It's only like half of chapter one at the moment. But you'll go download the slide deck, and then that'll be roughly equivalent to what you see in the type lecture notes. Okay. You'll, in fact, there might be a almost one-to-one -one co correspondence there. Some things, however, don't fit in the aspect ratio of a slide that fit in uh, a typical uh, book page uh, and vice versa. So um, let's see. I think that's pretty much everything. Everything's going to be low key in this course. Uh, it's all about learning. It's not about taking exams and quizzes and things like that. I have other courses that I teach that you, some of you have participated in. You know that those are really high stress, high... Uh, work courses, and this is not one of those. This is a laid back sort of thing, okay? So we're here to learn. I will say one last thing before I get started. It is very easy to not learn anything in a course like this, okay? It's very easy to not learn anything if I don't assign you to read or certain things or, or do certain problems. 
certainly if you don't have to prepare for ex exams, then the motivation to learn is less. Um, unless you're intrinsically motivated. So I hope that you are. There are going to be a couple of homework assignments, but you do have to be aware of the possibility that you won't learn something if you don't actively read about it or try to do some test problems or homework problems. Okay, With a lack of homework problems, that might be a little bit um, more of a struggle for you. Um, the books that I'm using as references then <clears throat> become more and more important. So you can see where I get information uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to be crystal clear about the references that I'm using for specific problems here and there. And you can go to that book, read that problem, but also read the problems which are like it, which are not covered in the lecture notes or the, or the, the slides, okay? So just be aware of that. You may have to be a little bit more active than uh, you would otherwise be in order to learn something. <laughs> All right. So I want to go over, as I said, in this first chapter, themes or problems which motivate what I ultimately want to convey, what theory and um, problems and applications I want to convey. So let's discuss in, in this first lecture, two motivating problems. And in the whole of the chapter, we'll discuss uh, five or six. So the first one is Sterling's approximation. So how many uh, physicists or engineers do I have in the audience who know about Sterling's approximation? Okay. I'm a, uh, mathematicians ever heard of Sterling's approximation? It comes up a lot in uh, in 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 uh, probability theory, and also in statistical mechanics. And for and the reason it comes up in statistical mechanics is because essentially you're using probability theory in there, and it comes out or comes up a lot of times when you're doing counting problems involving. Um, a lot of things. So you're you're doing counting problems, but now you're talking about factorials where it's like a million factorial so numbers, which are astro astronomically huge. So Sterling's approximation is all about approximating the factorial function, or better, it's about approximating the log of the factorial. So you've all probably seen and know what a factorial is. So n factorial is just one times two times three times n minus one times n. It gets really big really fast with n. We want to come up with a good approximation of this that doesn't involve this sort of ugly recursive uh, formula for large n. Now that's silly in some sense. We want to. We already know this is going to be large for even modestly sized n, why would we want an approximation for this for large n? That's just, it's like a Googleplex already, right? Why do you want such, why do you want an approximation for something which is large? Just call it infinity, right? Well, we actually need to know what that sort of big number looks like, how it plays out, how it feels. So this is uh, an approximation which is attributed to Sterling. And this is not necessarily the approximation that he gave. Although I will point out that um, the approximation is actually due a little bit earlier to a guy named Abraham de Moivre from in 1730, and uh, the same year Sterling refined the approximation, he basically gave a slightly better approximation, and for some reason, the approximation took his name afterward. Not it's not called de Moivre, de, de How do you say this name? De, de Moivre? I can't say it. I don't, I don't speak French well. I can say Sterling quite well, though. And maybe that's it. You know, maybe that's the reason why the name Sterling stuck. People like me who can't pronounce French names. So anyway, um, 
it's due to a French guy, but uh, was refined by Sterling and got his name. We're not going to approximate directly the factorial function. We're going to approximate the log of the factorial because it's a heck of a lot easier to understand. The log of the factorial, uh, so we're going to use the fact that if I take the log of a product, that's just the sum of logs. So the log of n factorial is log of 1 plus log of 2 up to log n. But of course, log of 1 is just equal to 0, so we can actually start counting uh, at 2. We're going to define this thing, ln, to be equal to the log of n factorial. So, in fact, the approximation that we'll derive, again, is not the same one that Demoivre or Sterling uh, came up with. It's not the same uh, mode of approximation. We're going to do something which is a lot simpler, but which also illustrates to us the, the type of approximations that we're going to be interested in uh, throughout the entire course. Okay, so we're interested in approximating ln, which is the log of n factorial. To get an approximation of this, we're going to create an integral, which is somehow related. The integral that we're going to compute is going to be the integral of log x, okay, from 1 to n. And this thing we're going to define as i n. The approximation that we're going to use uses this property that if I take the derivative of this function, x log x minus x, we just get the log of x. So that if we integrate log x, we can find the antiderivative very easily. Now, this function, interestingly, uh, for those of you who are physicists or engineers or may have be familiar with thermodynamics, comes up again and again. And this function is called the ideal gas law. Okay, x log x minus x is, uh, is what's called the ideal gas law, and it just so happens that it has this relation to log. Okay, if I take the derivative of this, I get log. That means if I take the integral of log, the antiderivative is the ideal gas, gas law or ideal gas model. So if I take the derivative of this guy, I get taking the antiderivative, evaluating at 1 and n, it's just going to be n log n minus n plus 1, okay? Using the fact that when I put in 1 for x here, I just get a 0. So our goal is to show in some sense that uh, ln, which is the thing we want, can be related to something that we can calculate that doesn't evolve a recursive formula. So this is what we want. And this is the thing which we think is somehow simpler. Now, in some sense, it's not simpler. In some sense, it is. Okay. So this is what we want, and this is what we're going to consider simpler. So in terms of or, or considering what we're going to do, or foreshadowing what we're going to do, we're always going to be interested in those sort of uh, things. We have something which we deem complicated, and we have another set of things which we deem simple and we want to approximate the complicated with the simple. Now, one person's complicated is another person's simple and vice versa. So keep that in mind. So I think the way you should really interpret uh, asymptotic approximations is using one set of things to approximate another set of things. Might not, you know, one might be simpler and the other harder and the other harder and the other simpler. But again, it's in the eyes of the, the beholder. So to establish this approximation, notice what we have here. <clears throat> this is uh, the integral of a simple function. Log is a kind of simple function. So how could we approximate this? Just this part here. We know what it's going to end up. It's going to end up as this expression here. So the way I'm going to do this approximation or run this approximation is that I'm going to use Riemann sums to approximate this log or this integral of log. So let's consider two Riemann sums and both of them having uniform uh, partition spacing of a size h equals one. Now, usually when you think about Riemann sums, you're thinking about 
a partition spacing which gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller to achieve a better and better approximation. That's not what we're going to do here. We're simply going to fix our partition size and see what we get. So we're going to use an upper and a lower Riemann sum. And the way we can generate the upper and lower Riemann sum is pretty easily by a picture, but let me give you the formulas before I show you the picture and then try to make sure that we understand how they relate. For the upper Riemann sum, we're going to use the sum, k equals 2 to n, of the largest value on a certain interval. And this largest value on the certain interval is going to be the log. It's going to be the value, value at the right-hand endpoint. Okay. Since log is an increasing function, the value at the right-hand endpoint is going to generate an upper sum. Okay. So notice that this my, my first sum, my upper sum, is actually going to be equal to the thing I want, the thing I want approximated. So the upper sum is the same as ln. Now let's, let's uh, generate a lower sum as well. Now the log function, again, is an increasing function. So if we take the Riemann sum generated by the left-hand endpoint, this is going to produce a lower sum. So the lower sum is going to be sum k equals 1 to n minus 1 of the log, okay? In fact, you can see it's just a shifting, and I'll show you this by a picture, proof by picture in a moment. But again, uh, when I put in k equals 1, that's the log of 1, that's 0. So essentially, this is the same as the thing I had above. It starts at 2, but it ends at a different value. It ends at n minus 1 instead of n, and so the approximation is the same as the thing I had before, except that I have one less value. So it's going to be log of n, or sorry, ln minus log of n. All right, so upper and lower sum. If, I have, if this truly is an upper sum, then the Riemann upper sum is going to be larger than the value of the integral, and the lower sum gives me an approximation which is smaller than the integral that I'm that I, I already know about. So this thing should be understood as known. The other thing is sort of unknown or more complicated. So the picture uh, really explains what's going on here. The upper sum is in red. So it's these guys here. So the first one you start out with is here. And so we use the right-hand endpoint. So we're always using the right-hand endpoint. And using the fact that log is an increasing function on the interval 1 to 10, let's say. So we're just using n equals 10 here, but of course, we, we have in mind to keep going n equals 100 or 1,000. The idea is n can be anything, but we're thinking about n as being large. The reason is because we already know how to calculate the factorial function whenever n is small let's say n is equal to three, four, that's all rudimentary elementary stuff. The, the problem becomes hard whenever n gets very, very large, okay? So we're imagining sending this off to infinity. In any case, red gives us an upper sum. Now, this appears as purple, but it's actually blue uh, underneath of red, so it comes out purple. So the lower sum is here. The first lower sum element is here. You can't see it. Uh, it's zero, right? The next one is here. We're always using the left-hand endpoint, and that generates the lower sum. But you can see pretty easily that uh, they're exactly the same approximations. It's just that this red one has an extra one at the end. In any case, RL is clearly below in value IN and our UN is clearly above. All right, so as I said, we have this sort of hierarchy of approximation, but we can compute these two things in terms of what is wanted. What is wanted is LN, which is the log of N factorial. Now you might say, why don't I put the LN in the middle and put the other thing uh, on the upper in the upper and lower bounds. Well, actually, if you ever generate uh, something like this, uh, inequality like this, you notice that you actually have the that thing that I just mentioned 
built in. For example, I can just shift things, right? So I can consider this one first, and then I can generate the next upper bound from here using actually this guy. All right, so what I mean to do is I'm going to use this bound right here, but I already know how to get an upper bound on LN involving IN, just use this one here. How do I do that? Well, add log N to both sides of this inequality. And then you see that LN is less than IN plus log N. Did everyone see what I did there? So I use this inequality and then I use this inequality. I just gave them the old switcheroo. Okay, so this guy comes first. Then I'm, I want an upper bound on LN, which is the log of N factorial. I'm going to use this inequality here to generate it by adding to both sides a log of, of N. Okay, so the log N comes over here, and I just have IN plus log N bigger than LN. LN is the log of N factorial. Okay, that's cool. So that kind of sandwiches between something involving IN, which I consider computable or nice, Okay, I have LN sandwiched in between those two things. So let's play around with this. This is this is it. This is uh, really all we need to produce uh, the approximation that we want. And it already says that in some sense, this guy approximates this guy. All right. So how how good of an approximation is it? Crummy, right? Pretty crummy. Because normally when we make an approximation like this, we want to say something like, let's call this the error, right? And then we want to say, well, the error goes to zero as the parameter goes to infinity. Does that happen in this case? Now, I have a friend who says that the log of infinity is seven, okay? The log of a big number is still pretty small, but it does go off to infinity. Okay, the log of infinity is not really seven. Get it? The log of infinity is not seven. It gets bigger as n gets bigger. This goes off to infinity slowly, slow as heck, kind of. Okay, but it does get there. And notice that um, I'm, I'm using natural log here. Could be another log base, log with another base, but okay. In any case, this is going off to infinity. So the error doesn't get squeezed down to zero necessarily. It could, this is just an upper bound, but normally I wanna use the squeeze theorem to conclude that this drives this error down to zero, but it doesn't happen. Okay, so the error is not getting smaller. Does that mean we should give up? So I can't conclude this. So, but if you've ever taken a course in physics, then you know there are different kinds of errors. Okay, um, well, you don't even have to be a physicist to appreciate that, right? There are something called the relative error, or there are different types of relative errors that one can generate. There's two types of relative error that I could generate here. I could consider the difference over LN, or I can consider the difference over IN, okay? The easier one is, since IN is kind of the known thing here, uh, let's use that computer relative error in that sense. Now, you might say, that's not really how you should do it, right? You should, you should to, to compute a relative error, you should take the exact minus the approximation over the exact, okay? Um, it's arguable, okay? So we're going to take something which is similar, so I call it a type of relative error. LN minus IN over IN. This guy actually does go to zero, okay? So in some sort of relative error sense, I am getting a pretty good approximation because this quantity is going to zero. And I'll show you that in, some, in, 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 a, in a moment, but let's prove this first. To see this, um, just divide everywhere by I n, and then you just use the fact that I know what this expression looks like, and I can compute this, this uh, quotient, take the, and, and take, Take the limit as n gets larger and larger, and this guy does indeed go to zero. So I'll leave it as a small exercise for you to see that that happens. 
So in some relative error sense, I am doing pretty, pretty well. Okay. I can show that this, uh, this approximation is sort of good in some sort of relative error sense. So the notation that we're going to use whenever we perform or achieve an approximation like this is to say that LN is approximated by IN or is asymptotically approximated by IN. And that exactly means in symbols, or this describes in symbols what we just said in this expression one, that this relative error goes to zero as n goes to infinity. All right, so Sterling's approximation then becomes the following. So since I have an approximation for IN, or I have an expression for IN, let's just write it out. So LN is just the log of N factorial, and IN is all of this stuff. So if you deem this as being a complicated expression, being written as something which is a little more elementary, then you've achieved something. The question is, is it useful? It turns out in physics, an approximation of this form is um, vitally important to doing statistical mechanics. Okay, so this is Sterling's approximation. You may not have seen it like this. You may have seen it in, um, in the sense of uh, directly an approximation for n factorial, in which case, we just take the, the if this is the natural logarithm, take the, take, take e of both, take um, e of both powers, okay? I'm not sure how to say e of both sides, exponential function of both sides. And that's the approximation uh, that's that's sometimes given. So let's see some numbers. So again, our approximation is not, is not necessarily good in the sense that the true error is going to zero. In fact, it actually gets larger and larger. Although, you know, it was bounded by the log function. As I said, the log of infinity is seven. It's not that big, right? Already for n equals 170, the, the error is only 2.5, okay? But that's not going to zero, and it doesn't even see, seem like a trend that it's going to zero, right? It's getting larger and larger, but it's kind of slow. However, the relative error is going to zero, okay? You can show that. In fact, we did show that. So that's the sense of the approximations that we're going to be making a lot of times in this course. We won't be able to show necessarily in some sense that, or in off, oftentimes, that the error is going to zero, but the relative error will be going to zero. And the approximation will still be quite useful for us. Questions about that? Okay, let's move on to another approximation that we want to do. So another big class of problems that we're going to be working on in this uh, course are going to be integrals with a large parameter, such that as this parameter gets larger and larger, um, we're going to, well, let's see. We're going, to, we're going to be interested in the integral for very large values of this parameter. And so you might say, well, why not just stick in a very large parameter and compute the integral and be done with it? We want, we want an analytic expression for the answer in terms of this large parameter, but which may only be valid for large values of the parameter, okay? So let me try to make that clear through an example. So the example that we're going to go through is this one. The integral uh, ix from 0 to infinity of e to the minus xt over 1 plus t dt, where in this integral, x is a large parameter. So this isn't necessarily an easy thing to do because we have to take the integral for every value of x that there exists uh, on the real line, right? Or actually, in this case, um, the, the positive half of the real line. So this is hard, right? Computing in, in an integral over a semi-infinite interval for every value of x, okay? So we want to be able to come up with some sort of analytic expression for this as a function of x, but which may only be valid for large values of x. Okay, so that's the goal. 
So there's no known analytic uh, expression for this integral in terms of simple, simpler functions. So let's try to do some tricks on this. The first thing we might want to do is apply what's called the binomial series to this problem. The binomial series is a series which tells us how to expand things like this, one plus t to a certain power, okay? The problem is, if we do it like that, if we try to apply the binomial series, it only works whenever t is less than or equal to one in, uh, in absolute value. Uh, so, you know, we're going to be integrating over t for all values, uh, on the positive side of the real line. So this is not going to work for us, right? Because this is only going to be valid as an expression for t small, right? t less than or equal to one in absolute value. So what can we do? We can't simply throw this guy into this uh, integral and then expand term by term. However, we could think about doing that, right? We could pretend it's possible. We could say, okay, it's not possible that this is going to be a valid expansion for all values of t, but throw that in there and integrate term by term. Uh, and you can do that. And that's effectively going to give us exactly the same result as we're going to obtain by uh, exact methods, okay? Being a little bit more careful with our analysis. So if we go willy-nilly and do this, throw that in there, we get the wrong answer for the wrong, we get the right answer for the wrong reason, okay? So let's do something else. Instead of using the infinite series, let's use a truncated series with an exact expression for the remainder for the same thing. So that's gonna be our kind of uh, in route for this problem. We wanna replace one over one plus T with a uh, series, but it can't be a series with an infinite number of terms because that doesn't necessarily converge. However, we can make a finite or a truncated series with a exact remainder. And it turns out this is a pretty cool little result that we can get a nice exact expression for the remainder term. Okay. So I'll let you uh, cook this up or prove this uh, as a homework exercise and we'll just take it as being valid. So instead of putting this guy in here, let's take our finite series with the exact remainder and throw that in there. By the way, you can always do this. It's just that, so I could always make an expression like this. I could say, I'm gonna set this guy equal to this series but the usual thing is, and I'll put a remainder here because, I, you know, there's some error. But the nice thing here is that I know an expression for that remainder term. That's the difference. Okay. So let's throw that into the integral. That means that we have the exponential against uh, the series and the remainder. And... Uh, so this involves a summation. So there's a bunch of integrals that I have to compute. Okay, and I'm gonna call that first bit Sn minus one. It's gonna stop at this term, which is the remainder. And I'm gonna call that bit of integrating that part plus that part. It's not a very good, sorry, let's do that again. This bit. I'm going to call that the remainder term. So in other words, Sn minus one is going to be defined as when I do that integration of this guy against uh, these terms here, then I'm going to get exactly uh, this series, okay? And the, ser and the terms of the series are exactly this thing I'm calling ak of x. It's going to be one minus one to the kth power k factorial over x to the k plus one uh, power. So how did I get this? Well, I used uh, an integral, um, uh, an integral um, by parts formula, an integral expression 
that's uh, tabulated in many places. And so if I integrate powers of t against e to the minus xt, then I just get this expression here. Okay. So again, uh, I mentioned that you can prove this using repeated integration by parts, or you can look it up um, somewhere. But in any case, I used this in order to produce this little series here. Now, the remainder term, I can't do much with that. That's the integral of the exponential function against this part. Can't really do much for, uh, with that. So I'm just going to um, write it out. Okay. Just put that in your pocket and save it for later. Okay, so that's exactly minus integral zero to, to infinity minus one to the n, t to the n, one plus t, e to the minus x t dt. Now, if you're keeping track of good things in life, um, what's the score here? I mean, did we trade something bad for something good? Uh, no, looks like we traded something which was kind of crappy and bad, for something which is kind of worse, right? Much worse, in some sense. Remember, the first integral didn't have that t to the power. There's no t to the power here, right? And um, I still haven't gotten rid of the exponential, and I still haven't gotten rid of the 1 over t. But this remainder has a nice form that I can deal with with respect to approximations. Okay. So everything we've done up to this point is exact. We're not, we haven't made any approximations. Uh, but suppose now we consider this remainder term. Remainder term doesn't look like it's any better than the original problem. Quite uh, to the contrary, it looks much, much harder than the original problem that we had to deal with. So if you might, you might be saying to yourself, I was hoping to be able to solve this remainder problem exactly, get an expression for it. But having an approximation of the size of the remainder is or can be just as good as having a, a an exact expression for the remainder okay and in fact that's what we're going to do here we're going to approximate the remainder term and see if this gives us something which is uh useful so let's estimate the size of the remainder so let's take the absolute value of this and uh, so Let's see, we had this minus one. The minus one nicely doesn't depend on t, so it can come out. Uh, we notice that everything else, t being positive, x being positive, is still positive, right? So when we take absolute value of the integral, it only kills off the minus one to the power, okay? Now, for t bigger than zero, we can use the fact that one over t, sorry, one over one plus t is less than or equal to one. So how do we prove something like this? Well, uh, one is less than one plus t, all right? So that means if I take reciprocals, one over one plus t is less than the reciprocal of one over one. Right. We're just using the fact that if we know that A is less than or equal to B and neither and both A and B are positive, you need you need that part. Then that means that. Uh, one over B is less than one over A, so that's what we're using there. So we know that this guy is less than one. So what we're doing is we're noticing everywhere else the the parts are positive. So if I replace this guy, one over one plus t with something which is smaller than that, or with something with something which is larger than that, then the whole integrand becomes larger, right? The whole integrand becomes larger. So replacing this with this larger thing, this larger thing is a nice thing. It's just one. Okay, so I get this. You might say to yourself, why? the hell didn't I do this in the first place, right? Just replace one over, because then the approximation doesn't get very far, right? We don't have any terms of an approximation. We simply say that the whole, the integral as a whole is less than some number. But now we've got some terms in an approximation and we've got a remainder term and now we can quantify the remainder term, 
Okay, so we've made we've done this re this replacement, but now it's in terms of uh, a quantity which is going to be quite quite interesting. Now we can do this integral. The integral that pops out here in the end is of the same type that we had here. So we can use the same approximate. Well, actually, it's not an approximation. Exact the same formula to compute this integral and generate our approximation for us. So that works out to be n factorial over x to the n plus one power, okay? So it just so happens that this is exactly equal to the absolute value of that term that I computed or tabulated earlier, a n of x, okay? A n of x was the, the terms of that series. Okay, they depend on x, they change with x. So each one of them is a function of both k and x. It changes every time I change k or iterate k, changes every time I change x. All right, so this is just the absolute value of a and x. So this is, this is quite interesting. It says that the remainder is less than or equal to the size of the the next term okay inside the series in absolute value that is okay so there's our there's the there's the term so for each x greater than zero we've come up with an approximation for the size of our remainder so the question is is that any good or not okay well that's that's cool because now we've generated us uh, kind of a, a, a finite series, and we have a handle on the remainder. So now all we have to do is ask, does it, is it useful? Okay, is it useful? So the series that we have is this thing we called S minus one, or N, S N minus one. So remember that by definition of the remainder term, I minus S N uh, minus one of X, that's the remainder term, in at least in absolute value. We have a handle on that. The remainder is less than the absolute value of a and x, which is exactly equal to n factorial over x to the n plus one power. Okay, so now if we fix x for each fixed value of x, you can usually the way things work is. Uh, you you fix an x and then you take more and more terms in order to accomplish the uh, order of accuracy that you want, right? Well, in this case, that's not going to work for us because the series that we've just generated diverges, okay? It diverges. It's not... So in some sense, <clears throat> we're always told then when, when we encounter a divergent series, we should throw it away and uh, move on to the next toy, right? Divergent series are inherently useless. Not true. Divergent series turn out, if you reframe your way of looking at them, they can be quite useful. And that's the sense in which we're going to use this divergent series, okay? We're going to use it from a different perspective. Now, for a fixed x and a fixed n, we can understand how large our error is in this approximation. We have a good handle on it because we know what the size of the remainder is. The problem is, as I just said, that series diverges. So there seems like a, a problem, but I'll show you in a moment, it's not really a problem. Now, why let's let let's answer the question why does the series diverge in the first place what we mean there is the series that would be generated by taking n off to infinity for a fixed x which is namely this guy here that diverges and it and it diverges because uh well because it does diverge and we 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 can see that through something called the the ratio test so the ratio test says take the ratio of uh, any two uh, values of, of the coefficient. So let's take um, absolute value of an plus one over an. And if you do that calculation, then you get 
n plus one over over x. So now remember what happens when you consider series, you fix x and you take n off to infinity. So there's no way that this term is going to converge to zero. That's what you would need to show that the series converges using the, 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 the ratio test. This guy goes off to infinity for any fixed x. Okay, so is that bad? That the, the fact that uh, our series diverges and, and does that nullify all that we've done? Does it make it useless? Well, it's maybe not all that bad. Let's play around with some of the approximations that we get from this and see if uh, see if they're useful or not. We just have to be careful. So, so what I claim is we just have to be careful for finite values of x. So let's take the value of x equal to 10 and see what happens. So using Mathematica, you can actually throw integrals like this in and they'll give you results involving uh, exponential integrals and things like that and things which they've tabulated to quite high order. So if I throw in x equals 10, I can get an exact value. By the way, we're gonna use Mathematica quite a lot in the course uh, to not only to generate approximations, but to uh, do some visualization. Mathematica is quite a good tool for doing asymptotic uh, approximations and perturbation theory, as we'll see. There's quite a lot of artificial intelligence under the hood in Mathematica, and it, 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 it does a lot. Uh, sometimes it does things that um, are so remarkable. Well, they're remarkable from the point of view that you have no idea where they're coming from. You have no idea what sort of algorithm it's applying, but it still seems to give some sort of almost or right answer. We're going to try to understand what is the theory or what, what approximation method is it using whenever you say asymptotically approximate this integral. Okay, so that's the that's the goal of the course. Although you don't need the course because you can just type in Mathematica and, and it'll give you an answer. Sometimes the asymptotic approximations that you get out of Mathematica are complete garbage, and we can prove that's the case because we can do the we can do the analysis. You know, we're people, right, who, who have some mathematical skills, and we can analyze what's going on under the hood. And there are times whenever Mathematica is just not a perfect tool simply returns garbage and you have to interpret it. But is it garbage or is it a good approximation? Well, here it's a good it's a good approximation. It's not an asymptotic approximation. It's just they're doing the exponential integrals exactly. And if I put in x equals 10, I get out this value. Now, okay, so 10 isn't very large. Remember I said we're interested in these approximations as x gets large. And that's the key that makes our... Um, the series we just produced good, okay, in some sense, because we're going to want to make X very large. Normally when you're applying uh, power series to some approximation, X is fixed, it's not that large. Okay, it's not outside, it, it's not huge. And you take, a, a, you take a larger and larger number of terms in order to get the convergence or the error under a certain amount. But here, um, uh, X for us, is, we're going to think about being large, uh, a large parameter, and it's going to get larger and larger. Now, this parameter so far isn't all that large. X is just equal to 10. It's That's fairly pedestrian. So here's the value we get, roughly 0 0.09156, okay? So if I use N equals three or three terms, if you want to look at it, it's actually a four-term approximation whenever I'm using n equals three because I'm using n equals zero, one, two, and three. So that's four terms. So there are the four terms I'm adding up, and I get the approximation 0 0.0914. Not bad, right? Not bad even for x equals 10. Seems like a pretty good approximation, okay, from a divergent series, right? That's pretty unexpected. Okay, so there's my approximation of the exact value. And we know, or we have a good gauge about how good the approximation is because we have an estimate of our remainder term. So remember, the remainder term R4 is going to be bounded by the absolute value of A4 uh, evaluated at 10. And in this case, this thing just so happens to be positive, so we don't have to take absolute value of it. And that value is 4 factorial over 10 to the 5th, 
and that turns out to be 0 0.00024. So that's pretty small. So that tells us that that's our, that's our approximation. If that's good enough for you, you can stop there and be done. If we take the next approximation, we get something which is even better, right? This time it turns out to be negative. So we'll have to take absolute value. So A5 evaluated at 10 is 0 0.00012, which is exactly half of this error here, right? Or half of the error approximation. So it's getting better. That might miss that might fool you into thinking for this fixed value of X, I'm just gonna get better and better by taking more and more terms in my approximation, right? But that's not true because our series diverges, that can't happen. Okay, so the party doesn't last because as we keep getting larger and larger, we know that this guy is gonna go off to infinity in absolute value. There's no way of uh, holding that back. That n, that n factorial which dwells in the top is not going to be contained, right? So let's look at uh, the table on the next page and see how this goes. So remember, this is an approximation for the error. And I put the sign of that uh, term over here. So let's take uh, this a n of 10, x is equal to 10 again. And let's just take larger and larger values of n and see where we get, see what we get. All right, looks like the error estimate keeps decreasing, keeps decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. Here it actually stagnates, right? Exactly the same value. But then the party is really over because it starts getting bigger, right? As it has to. So it looks like it bottoms out. There's the smallest value, and then it comes back up. And we can look at the approximation values. So if I go down to that, that term where is sort of the turning point, I could say, well, maybe A9 or A10 gives me my best value uh, for the approximation. And I think I do, I have an error here. This sh There should be another zero in here, missing zero. Okay, in any case, the value that I want to use is probably somewhere in this range, this one or this one. Okay, that's the best value that I can get for x equals 10 uh, with, with the series that I just created, okay? Because I fixed x and I need to take larger, and, or I, I'm taking larger and larger values of n. At some, place I gotta, some point, I got to stop. But the nice thing is I can quantify where I should stop, right? Uh, looks like about here where the error no longer, the error estimate no longer goes down. So after, uh, if we do the same thing for x equals 20, now x is larger, okay? Here's an interesting fact that happens after uh, the 20th term, that is whenever n is also equal to 20, that's whenever those a n values start to get larger. So roughly speaking for, for x equals 10 and n equals 10, things started getting larger after n equals 10. So n equals 11, it's larger. Um, so the same trend you can show for uh, the approximations involving x equals 20. At some point, there's no you can't do any better in that series. So the question is, is this series useless? Uh, let's consider one other thing. Um, this one isn't as important in the whole scheme, but uh, it, it's kind of, of, of interesting. We can observe that Rn alternates in sign with n. So our remainder term goes one side of zero, then the other side of zero, and so on. And so what this says is that actually, you, and you can show this, that um, the values of Sn minus one and Sn are sort of going to bracket uh, the approximation. So if it's above, or if, sorry, if it's below uh, the value of, of, of i for n minus one, then it goes above for the next value and it keeps alternating. Okay, you can show that that's the case. So in fact, I can do a little bit better than what I did before. I can actually bracket my approximation for, for i of 10 
using S of nine and S of 10. So I really have this thing nailed down pretty, pretty, pretty closely. I mean, I know that it's between these two numbers. Okay. All right. Now, what is it about this approximation that it's used for? Remember, the key feature here was not that the series is divergent. It still is divergent. There's no way of rescuing uh, a divergent series and making it somehow convergent. The key was in saying that X gets larger and larger. So we're considering this as a function of X. So here's the idea of asymptotic approximations. It's reframing how you look at the approximation. Instead of taking N to infinity, what you're going to do is fix N and take X to infinity, okay? Because that's what we're actually interested in. We're actually interested in large, larger and larger values of X. And in this sense, this approximation actually gets better and better, even in an absolute sense, as X gets larger and larger. Because look, in an absolute sense, if I fix N and I send X off to infinity, ultimately, this value is going to dominate N factorial because N factorial is a finite number. Okay, so for example, if I take N equals four or N equals 10, then yes, 10 factorial is a pretty large number. But ultimately, and eventually, the fact that I'm looking at large values of X means that my approximation is going to be getting better and better. So the way I'm going to view this is as the following. Approximations uh, in the sense that we're going to be in, interested in them. And this happens uh, for a lot of the cases. For example, when we're approximating something called the Bessel functions, um, those approximations look like, or those functions look like this. And our approximation might start out kind of not so great, but after a while it starts really hugging. So, you know, if we use a finite number of terms, let's say n equals three, but we expect to send x off to infinity, we can actually do pretty well, okay? So the series that we just generated while you might not want to take an infinite number of terms or even consider a large number of terms, does become a better and better approximation as X gets larger and larger, okay? So I'm going to stop there today, kind of a shortened lecture. Um, just wanted to give you two really important classes of problems where the usual sort of way of thinking maybe leads you to believe that all the work that you put into it is for nothing. Like in the first example, when coming up with Sterling's approximation, the absolute error wasn't being driven to zero. However, the relative error was, and the relative in the relative error sense, we're doing quite well in our approximation as n gets larger and larger. In this case, when we're trying to approximate the solution of, uh, uh, of an integral as a function of a parameter, which gets larger and larger, which is uh, useful in many, many cases for example, whenever you're doing uh, Laplace transforms and things like that, you're interested in what the solution looks like for large values of a parameter X or some other parameter. And so in that sense, I might not want to take an infinite number of terms in my approximation that I can generate. And remember, you can take, you can keep, in a, you can blindly believe that I could keep generating better and better terms just because I can con continue to take more and more terms. Well, that's not the way you should look at it. You should uh, you should give up eventually and say, I'm, I'm done computing terms, that's that's for the birds, and, and then say, well, okay, but now as, as X gets larger and larger, which is the regime I'm really interested in, I realize that this, this approximation gets better and better. Okay, so it's not a very good uh, drawing of the Bessel functions there, so I apologize, but uh, that's the sense in which we're going to be interested in these approximations fixing n and letting x go to infinity, not the other way around. Fixing n, let x go to infinity, not fix x and let n go to infinity, okay? So the next time we're gonna pick up on dealing with how do you deal with algebraic equations like um, simple polynomials when you're trying to find roots, but there's a parameter in there that's changing. So we're gonna investigate that next time. And uh, if you have any questions, you can, uh, approach me afterwards or send uh, a message in the chat. 
uh, but we'll end five minutes early or six minutes early and uh, I'll take your questions or you can send me an email if you happen to think of something later. Uh, but in any case, have a nice day and I'll see you on Thursday.